Well, hi there. Thanks for finding the Profitable Photographer with Lucy Dumas here on YouTube. If you want more, you can just go to any podcast channel and find the show or go to lucydumascoaching.com, Lucy with an I, to learn more about me and to listen to shows. And thank you for subscribing, sharing with your friends, and I hope you enjoy. Bye for now. Excellence is the gradual result of always striving to do better. And that's a quote by Pat Riley. And I am beyond excited today to share my guest with you, Jerry Gionis. If you haven't heard that name, well, uh, where have you been um, <laughs> in the last 20 years? How long has it been? Almost 30 years, uh, almost 30 years as a professional and um, about 22 years of teaching. Right, so, yeah, right. It's been a, lot, been a long time. So my math's pretty pretty good there. Yeah. <laughs> so anyone that would like to know more about me, just go to lucydumascoaching.com, Lucy with an I. And I just want to get on with the show here because I've got like this treasure trove of a human being uh, <laughs> smiling back at me. And um, <laughs> so I want to, I'm not going to pick your brain, but I'd like to go wander around in it for a bit. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. What a great line. Oh, I love it. All right. So Jerry is widely regarded as one of the top five wedding photographers in the world. His theatrical and iconic images have redefined modern wedding photography. He is a proud, we call it Nikon ambassador. <laughs> you say Nikon, right? Well, I mean, you got to remember that when you say we, well, Nikon is a Japanese company and it's pronounced Nikon. So I, I, every American is saying it incorrectly. Exactly. <laughs> so, so when I say we, I mean every every American. I, I wasn't <laughs> claiming we were right. Just that that's what we say around here. That's awesome. So I've learned how to speak Australian and New Zealand. Perfect. And it's how you say, yeah. So in California, we say, yeah. Yeah. And and you say yeah, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <laughs> and yeah. Australia or New Zealand, they say yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I'm fluent in <laughs> I love it. It's perfect. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. He was the first Australian named on the first ever list of top 10 wedding photographers in the world by American Photo Magazine also named Australian Wedding Photographer of the Year by the AIPP. He's proud to have won the WPPI, I like to call it WIPI, but Wedding and Portrait <laughs> Photographers <laughs> International Wedding Album of the Year. I but, wouldn't worry about all that stuff, Lucy. People can just Google that. Okay. Yeah, but, yeah. you know, <laughs> anyway, I remember when you won the Album of the Year the first time and how your work just sort of blew the lid off everyone's imagining what's possible. So, yes. Thank you. It's been a long <laughs> so time. <laughs> you've got a long list. Well, I'd like to know what you're the most proud of, of your achievements. I'm most proud of my relationship with my wife. That's hands hands down the easiest the easiest answer that I can give you. So Okay. Yeah, that's the, what I'm most proud of. Absolutely. Now, is there something... And I love that. And <laughs> I wish I had that. Um, is there something in your career, you know, an award you received or yeah. something that was just like, wow? Yeah, there's been some milestones, I've got to say. I remember getting, I remember growing up buying, I think, one of, if not the first issue of American Photo Magazine as a child, uh, as a teenager. And I got obsessed with American Photo. And then you know, as I started growing in the industry, I got this email saying this is the first ever compilation list that, you know, that I don't know how they conducted that list or how they created it, but it was, you know, we we would like to include you as one of the top 10 wedding photographers in the, in the world in an issue of our magazine. And I'm like, this is crazy. Um, so I literally was wiping the tears uh, by the end of reading the email. So that was pretty amazing. <laughs> it got watered down when Every year thereafter, they just chose a new list, but <laughs> I'm not going to let it diminish how I felt at the time, how they came to that. But that was cool. Winning the, my first grand award at WPPI was mm -hmm. certainly a, a highlight. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny, like after all these years, um, I think you're only really as good as your last shoot. You know, I, I, there's no doubt I've, I've done some pretty cool stuff over the years and, and I'm really proud of 
my work, but ultimately a lot of the, my personal milestones has been making a bride believe in herself that she's beautiful. It could be a, a portrait client that didn't expect miracles, but all of a sudden got a beautiful, meaningful portrait of themselves. And, mm -hmm. you know, the, the trophies are great. The accolades are great and, and all that kind of stuff. But I think that being here after, you know, almost 30 years in this industry and not having done anything else, as a professional, I think longevity, I think, is a is a very important thing as well. But um, yeah, I'd say that there there are the few things. I remember Microsoft um, announcing, you know, me and and a few others in my industry as an icon of imaging. That was pretty cool. But yeah, there's there's been a few things over the years. It's been it's been good. Yeah, yeah. I would say for me, just still being around forty years later, full time, no rich husband, no inheritance. Yeah. Yet, um, <laughs> you know, didn't win the lottery. Yeah. Um, managed and still managed to have a good life. Um, yeah, it's amazing. And I remember speaking at the Professional Photographers of California convention and someone saying, oh, I came to this convention just to hear you speak. It's beautiful. That was a moment where I realized. I had gone from one stage in the career to that next one where I was able to give and share and support other people. And one of those people that came to that convention changed her whole business profile, I used to speak on how to photograph children. And it, it was very detailed. And she said, we went home, we did your business model, and we've had a thriving children's career. So I'm sure you would agree. It's those. Yes, I loved getting my PPA master's. That that was a huge achievement. But it's those wins that are earlier that yeah. uh, can kind of keep us. Does that keep you kind of moving forward, or are you someone that's always pushing yourself anyway? I, I think I'm always pushing myself. I'm always reinventing myself. For me, it's very much. And I say this all the time, but it's, it, it certainly rings true. And that is, I always focus on the process, not the result. And that's with anything in life, whether it's photography related or personal development, whatever it may be. I think that too many of us worry about the result. Like, I'll only go to the gym and I'll keep on going to the gym if only I see quick results. Mm. I'm like, I'll just focus on doing the work. Um, you know, some people get obsessed with competition in photography. And I certainly have been there in my career, but... It wasn't about the the pat in the back or the accolade. It was actually the process of of doing the work, which is mm -hmm. what the it might be a cliche, but it, it it's just the truth. You know, I love the process of creating, and in the last two three years, uh, obviously we've all had a tough time in the world, and in terms of just you know COVID and a lot of stuff that's been going on, let alone the US and all the stuff that's been happening. And I've probably produced some of the best work in my career, but I've had this really long social media break. And I don't care. Like, I, I, I'm not, like, obsessed with affirmation and, and, and I'm, I'd rather be obsessed with pleasing my clients and having quality time with my family. And, and those, those things are more meaningful to me. And don't get me wrong, you know, support and affirmation is fine, but it's all very temporary. Um, right. so for me, it's always about the creative process, whether it's a business idea, whether it's a, uh, the next wedding shoot, that's the next portrait shoot or creating a product or something, you know, for me, it's, that's, what's fun. That's the fun bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've been feeling a little bit flat thanks to COVID sure. and I, I've not been shooting as much as I have been coaching and doing podcasts. And I realized, oh. I haven't really been creating in the in the physical, you know, I've been creating a lot of things, like I write more than I used to. And when I was younger, I used to write a lot, but I need to get out there and do some creative things to fill that void, I think, to get over some of that flatness. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Well, my advice to you is that I find that many of us you know, whether you're a parent, whether you have partners, whether you have offspring, whatever it may be, I think we spend too much time taking care of others. And so, Lucy, if if you got booked by a client, nothing will steer you away of that particular meeting, that shoot, whatever it needs to do to fulfill that expectation of that client, you, you book it in and then nothing 
nothing can stop that. I find that most of us, what we do is we do not give ourselves the same respect as strangers. Mm. In other words, you know, I could book a wedding a year away from now and, and short of having a broken leg and even then it probably wouldn't stop me, I would do that wedding. Whereas we don't book ourselves with the same respect and say, today I want to play because if I feed my soul today or every month or every week, whatever it is for you, that'll help me feed my mouth because mm -hmm. you're doing it for the love of it, not, not at the behest of a particular client. You're doing it for the love and the art and the practice of it. And then the next time you're, you're doing a shoot where you are getting paid for it or whatever, you're basically more fulfilled because you've, you've, you've had your playtime. Mm -hmm. And then you can use that skill and experience and that and that warmth uh, on your next shoot. And right. so that's the thing is that, yeah, we've got to treat ourselves with uh, similar, if not greater respect than even clients. Right, right. And during the pandemic, there was more time available for many of us to do those things. Sure. And yet for me, it was in some ways harder because when I'm like, okay, I go to the gym these days, I do this, these days, you know, like have a routine. And when all of that was then gone, then it was always like, oh, I can do that tomorrow. I can do that next week. Do you have thoughts about, for those of us that work for ourselves, how you kind of set that framework? I think that most of us, I think the biggest mistake that most of us make in the world, doesn't matter in the photography industry, everyone thinks they have time. Mm -hmm. I've got time. I'll have time to get fit. I'll have time to do that shoot, time to have the, do that website, whatever. We just think we have time. We'll, and often, you know, you will ask the question of each other, like, hey, how are you? And, and, and someone responds, I'm getting there. And I'm like, well, where is there for you? Everyone believes they're not there. It, there's always something more that they're striving for, which means that it affects their, their ha happiness temporarily and long term. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess that's the that's the problem is that we don't know where we're going and we don't appreciate things as they come to us. Mm -hmm. So you know, Melissa and I, we have a very strict routine in the sense that we we wake. When I say strict routine, we wake up and we wake up. Now, usually that's that's one of my golden doodles. Zoe, in particular, she'll <laughs> she'll jump on my chest. She'll you know give me kisses and and she'll want me to jump in the pool with her first thing in the morning. And that's usually how I wake up, which is a great way to wake up. And then we work. And then at about five o'clock or four o'clock or six o'clock latest, we stop working. Uh, weekends, if I don't shoot weddings, we just don't work. And I'm very protective of that time. And some people, you know, might say, well, Jerry, I tried to reach out to you, whatever. And I, I you know, my personal time is more valuable than even my work time. Right. So, so basically I prioritize that because it makes me stronger and healthy and reminds me what I'm working for. So when I do work, it becomes more fruitful. And then there's times where I have off and then I'm so rejuvenated where I'm dying to get to work and and live a purposeful life during those hours. But once mm -hmm. those hours are done, I'm done. And then I, I enjoy my life in a very different way. So, you know, you've just got to put your priorities right and realize that time is the most important commodity in the world and you have to value it. Whether right. you're incredible at what you do, whether you've just started as a photographer, the fact is the minute you give up your time, that's got to be worth something. And mm -hmm. if you add value and experience and reputation along with that, well, you can charge more for your time. Right. So what I hear is having a routine, which is for you, what you do when you first get up. And then, then you see yourself as I'm at work, we're at work. So we're working during those hours. And then when you're off, you're off. Yep. And unless you choose to work on a weekend because weddings are mostly on weekends. <laughs> then if not, then that's, that's your family time. And so it's that, it's that routine. As I mentioned, that was some of my challenges. I had a routine pre COVID and then many of the things that were my habits, we couldn't do anymore and trying to substitute those and I live by myself so there's not and my my cats got old and they're gone mm -hmm. so there's no um but I have routines with my coaching clients and photography clients and such so yeah that's and yeah. man time does go fast it's it's surprising when you wake up and all of a sudden 
you've been in this business 30 years, 40 years, 10 years. Right. Yeah. So trying to come up with some, like, what would I like to talk to Jerry about today <laughs> <laughs> was so um, confusing because it was, it was like, okay, I'm going to have a chat with Michelangelo. So <laughs> tell me, Mike, how did you like that? that uh something well, I, like you're a wealth of what you teach which is so much so much of your materials in your classes are about understanding and using light in an exquisite way but i know you're also you know you've got so much thinking and wisdom and and so forth so yeah <laughs> is there anything else before i ask you some questions that Possibly, I know talking about lighting when this is not a video can be a little challenge, but is there anything sure. else that's been on your mind or that's been exciting you lately? <laughs> um, I, I guess everything excites me. I, I, for me, I am genuinely, like I said, excited about the creative process. Uh, mm -hmm. Recently, um, you know, I, I wanted to create a, a, a very brand new uh, educational product, which is going to take a couple of months to produce, but the shoot part of it, I gave myself a challenge to photograph 15 different subjects in very uniquely different ways. And where most people would probably do that over several months, I said, I'm going to do it in a week. <laughs> so I, I got <laughs> five not? days, five or six days, I think it was, of shooting. And it was like three odd subjects per day. And sometimes it was a premeditated, this is the idea that I've got. And then sometimes it was like, let's just bring the the subject matter, the person, the portrait, the client, whatever. And I'm going to decide there and then I'll meet you. I'll look at some clothing options and then we just have fun. And then I approach it differently. So it, I, I call it a bit of a blitz, a creative blitz. And I've produced some, probably some of my best work in my career in the last couple of weeks. And it's because I gave myself time to refresh, recharge and produce something new. I went shopping on Amazon, got some props and different things. I booked locations and uh, we just had a ball and mm. it's been amazing. As far as light's concerned, I think, and posing, I think those two words are often put together. So before we yeah. jump to, because I have some specific questions on oh, that. Oh, please, go for but it, yeah. I love what you shared that you have. So you're putting a new education program together, right? Mm -hmm. And then you wanted to have some new images and so you you gave yourself the like I'm going to do it all in a finite amount of time. Sure. And then you got to work finding props and coming up with some ideas, leaving the the muse available to give you other ideas. Is that kind of summarizing? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And then, and then out of that has blossomed some work that is new and exciting for you that that is filling your creative cup. 100%. And then you get to share it with the world. Exactly. Yeah? exactly. So it, it sounds like it's starting with that first, this is what I'm going to do. And then, then letting that, like jumping on the horse and letting that. Look, you, you could be the most talented up. person in the world in, of any industry and in every genre, but without work, it, 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 it's nothing. It's actually a waste. It's even, it's more sad <laughs> because you like not, it's not usually the most talented person will win. Right. It's the, it's usually the most hardworking. Now, okay. If you're blessed with some attributes of a particular that's conducive of helping you succeed in a particular industry or genre, fantastic. I'm just a doer. I think that the difference between successful and unsuccessful is that successful people are doers. They're not more talented. They just like I'm, I'm very obsessive. So if I have an idea in my in my brain, I just tend to execute quickly. Mm. Um, and and I guess that's the problem. And one of my favorite quotes I said organically in conversation, but I'm, I've repeated this in many many conversations. And and that is, creatives aren't short of ideas. The problem is committing to one. Mm. <laughs> you could have a, a girl really walk into your studio or your home, whatever it is, and you've got an infinite number of ways of photographing her. Where do you begin? Right. So you've got to, at one point, commit to an idea and pretend it's the best idea in the world mm -hmm. and then be happy about it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. One of my yeah. big challenges when I go to an environment, because I love doing natural light as much as I can 
in a beautiful environment that also has good lighting I can work with is an environment like I went to um, Vail, Colorado, and it happened to be the perfect weekend where the aspen trees were at their peak. So no one was going to say, oh, you should have been here last weekend or it'll be better next week. It was like happened to be the weekend. And imagine Vail, Colorado in the mountains with aspen trees, yellows and oranges and trying to figure out where to work. It's just like, I almost feel it in my throat, (laughs) down to my chest, the anxiety and the excitement and, you know, scouting and, ah, you know, that, that stress, but that stress also created some really beautiful images. But if I'm given like in San Diego, I know you, you've been here. Yes. Of course. Yeah. Beautiful. beautiful So we don't have a lot of wide open spaces and sometimes that's better for me because this park only has this many target rich places. So I use those and then I go deeper into the posing and the just all the other stuff. Instead of a buffet, it's like a beautiful plate of food. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Yeah, Yeah, that's very cool. (laughs) Yeah. So my audience likes action steps, I've heard. And I'd love to talk since your biggest claim to fame is besides everything else is the being the lighting guru, at least from where I sit. So could you share some, like, where does a beginner start both in thinking and understanding lighting, what equipment? Sure. So look, I often get questions, people saying, Hey, should I invest in a DSLR or should I go mirrorless? I'm like, that's just a a, a no brainer question. Mirrorless just makes life more fun, efficient, confident, and freedom. Like it's basically because you can see live exposure. um, You're seeing what you get and it just makes it so easy to, to, to capture a photograph. And I say capture because without creating, without empathy, without posing, lighting or whatever, you're just capturing what's in front of you. If you can craft something, well, that's another story. So people have to think of their camera as a tool you make the difference. In terms of lighting, I often, when I'm teaching a beginner and even an experienced person, I often say, I want you to liken every light source to water and you begin to understand it a whole lot better because lighting, people see it as not tangible. They see the results of light as tangible because I can see that light on that face, but they don't see the action or the or the, the beams of light. They can't see it unless I get smoke in a can and spray it in front of a beam. So, or creating a beam. So, when I say you've, if you walk into a camera store and you look at every modifier that they have and you liken that lighting source or modifier to water, you'll know exactly what it does. In other words, if you see a, a, a big softbox, that is basically like the sun being behind a cloud and the sun is projecting through the cloud, which is basically like a, a strainer and it's actually making that light source bigger and broader and softer, no different than you looking at a softbox that has an inner baffle, an outer baffle, and it spreads the light out and it makes it soft. Now, let's pick a maybe not so easy example to understand that may be easy after I explain it. If you were looking at a, an umbrella and there's an umbrella that you can telescope in and out. In other words, the strobe can go closer to the inside of, a, of an umbrella or further out like if you're looking at one of those kind of things, if you bring the strobe closer, if you bring a hose closer to an umbrella, would it ricochet softer or broader? Well, it'll be sharper. It'll be more contrasty. In other words, if you get that ricochet closer to that water, it'll ricochet sharper, which means you get a stronger quality of light uh, or, or water in this case. If you bring, if you telescope that water out, so to speak, as in, you got a hose and you actually pushed it out of the middle of an umbrella, it will go a little bit softer to the skin and broader. Again, you walk into the shower, you know, when you most people will turn their tap on of their shower, let the water warm up a little bit before you walk in it. And what happens is this phenomenon, which is really weird, is that you, you know, you you put your hand underneath the water and it's 
it's soft to the touch and it's warm. But when you finally step in, the fringes of that water are quite cold on your skin. No mm. different than a big, broad light source, a big softbox. If you put someone on the edge of that light source, you could make that light source look like it's a very small, sharp, contrasty mm. light source. No different than, again, feeling that cold water on the fringes of that warm that warm shower that you basically prepared for 30 seconds in advance of, of your shower. So liken light to water and you'd be able to understand it. Literally, I mean, I know that this is a podcast, so perhaps you might not do a visual version of that conversation, but right now I have a continuous light source on the opposite wall. I've bounced it into the corner, which means I have a small hose bouncing in the corner of my room and it's flooding light in and around me, therefore making it look like a big light source. I have mm -hmm. the ice light, a, a small cylindrical light source behind me, and it's hitting the edge of my jaw, giving me an edge light. In other words, I've got this light source dampening everything, mm -hmm. and then I've got a little light source overpowering that dampness, which is an edge light. So when someone walks into a studio and gets very intimidated by using strobes, Mm -hmm. I'm like, let's cut the math out of it. Just cut the crap out of it. Let's just look at what we're doing. And I say this, if you're doing a three light setup, let's say you're doing a hair light, a main light and a fill light. I say, just put your exposure on something predictable and easy that, that, that will support the quality and the speed of which you want to freeze the motion. Let's say it's just a normal portrait, someone's standing there. Great. 250 speed, F8, 100 ISO. Great quality, easy. All right, there's my exposure. And depending on what flash system you use, I, I personally favor Profoto. So I will have all my lights off and turn one light at a time. I'll start off with my fill light. That's going to be the biggest light source, usually seven foot octobox behind me. I can even stand in front of that octobox and I'm not going to, it's not going to affect the lighting. Now, why, why is that phenomenon happening? Well, let's say if there was a big, big, big fountain right behind me and it was flooding, flooding me, but I was standing in front of it. Would the person in front of me get wet? Well, of course they would because the lighting is so big and broad. I'm not really affecting the output that much by standing in front of it. Ah. Then what I do is I take a shot until I can just see detail. In other words, I am dampening my entire environment. In other words, I'm improving my dynamic range by getting detail everywhere. Great. I don't, I'm not going for a good exposure yet, as in I'm not going for that shot on its own. That's not my main light source. That is not my main fountain. So I dampen the entire environment where I can just see detail. Boom, mm -hmm. turn that off. Okay. Lovely. Now I've got my hair light. So I take my shot until I can just see detail in the rim of the hair on the shoulders and the arms or whatever I'm using. Great. I turn that light off. Then I turn my main light on. I'm making sure that I get the direction of light, the shadows that I want, and the exposure that I want from my main light, because that's going to be illuminating everything. Great. I've got that. So then I turn those three lights on. And hey, presto, I've got an incredible exposure. I didn't get it, bring out a light meter like I used to. I'm not working out maths and understanding the inverse square law, which is important right. to understand the, the foundation of what that means, but it's less mathematical. It's more to do with feeling. Once right. I've done that, then I forget about my lighting and I focus on connecting with my clients. Every so often I'll recalibrate them and say, hey, turn your face bias to the light. And ultimately though, it's just one step at a time. I, mm -hmm. I, I have a very specific technique. There's five steps in my humble opinion, to a great photograph, and I follow those steps every single time in almost every genre, mm. and it works. So can you say again, because I was totally with you on the fill light, that you just you adjust everything until you just see everything eliminated. Exactly. I can just see it. And then the hair light until you're just seeing the hair light. What's your guy? I'm just seeing detail on my hair. I'm just seeing Details. detail okay. on my on, on the on the fringes of the shoulders yes. and the or whatever I'm doing. And so with the main light, can you share again? Because I I was lost in visualizing the other two. No, that's okay. <laughs> so well, what I, more specifically, what I'm what I'm looking for with my main light is detail in the brightest highlight on the face. Mm. 
So it doesn't matter whether it's whether we're photographing dark skin, Caucasian, it doesn't matter. I'm after detail relative to the skin tone of the person that I'm photographing. Okay. The biggest mistake people make when they photograph African American skin, for example, is that they're trying to make the African American skin look Caucasian. Mm. Um, so I'm after detail in the brightest highlight. Now, obviously, I'm after depending on how I position my subjects. I'm after shadow and highlight, shadow and highlight, because the mm. more of that I see, the deeper that shot looks and becomes. But I'm after detail in that in that highlight. Once I do that and recognize that I've got detail on those highlights, and that implies I don't have details in my shadows. Well, I do have details in my shadows. At a bare minimum, I've got the detail that I got with my fill light. The ratio of contrast and contrast ratio, understanding the what you want as in, if you want the difference between highlight and shadow to be not so great, as in that's where your fill light will dampen that entire environment even more. Mm-hmm. So without those two lights that we discussed, that fill light, we simply go for a bit more dampness. I want to wet the environment a bit more. Right. which means the difference between highlight and shadow will not be so great. Depends on the person, the skin type, um, their size, what you're trying to say, the purposeful nature of the shot as to how far you go with that. So where my mind goes is that it's a little like cooking. We want to learn the proportions. If you're making hundred percent a sauce, you want to learn what goes into it, like how much of each. As we're learning, and then sure. a certain point when we become more in the chef or the you know <laughs> the great home cook, sure we don't we don't have to measure as much unless it's baking. Baking is a s- complete chemistry science very, yeah, thing. Science, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. I'm I'm getting that feeling on there because I've wondered. So thank you for that because um, I noticed. People aren't using meters like they used to, and people don't understand what a stop of light is uh, in theory. So what I'm hearing from you is it's good to learn that, and then you can do what looks right, what feels yeah. right. Photography is so different now, and I don't, I don't want to sound like <laughs> like I'm 49. I just turned 49 a couple of weeks ago, but, um, you know, here's the thing. I think that there are some photographers who have been in the industry for a very long time and begrudge how easy it is for new photographers to to somewhat master their craft or at least get a decent photograph. I say I'm so thankful for technology yeah. because back in the day when, you know, you'd photograph on film and you'd have a short amount of time and also every shot cost you a dollar as you, as you press the shutter. Or in my case, I shot with the Mamiya RB67, so it took me three actions to take one photograph. Click the shutter, cock the mirror, wind the film. Mm-hmm. And every shot was with a light meter because there was no inbuilt light meter. Um, Polaroid, but the, but you can't do that on everything. And even then, Polaroids are, are, are crazy. So shooting uh, on location was a lot easier back in the day with a light meter. Light meter, though, in the studio is still quite intimidating. Excuse my little baby here. Oh, <laughs> Ooh, baby. let me see I your little baby. I love you, my baby. Okay. I know, I know. I'll play with you after, La- baby. Little labradoodle. I'll, I'll play. Yeah, little Big golden doodle. <laughs> yeah, love it. Um, so, oh, what was I getting at here? What was I? Uh, I just got... Uh, out, outdoors, it was easier to use the light meter, but people get intimidated with yeah. flash meter. When you're in the studio, you have to very, very specifically understand what contrast ratios were all about, um, how to meter for, for different things, how much detail do you want on a the background. Uh, there were so many different things. It was mm-hmm. just crazy. Now, I could literally say to students out there, because I suffered, <laughs> let's say suffered, I learned the hard way because I had to, that you should do the same because or there's some romantic notion attached to doing it the hard way. I'm saying my personal advice is don't waste your time, energy, uh, on a light meter, I don't think it, it it's needed because you might approach something scientifically rather than actually just look at what feels good to you. Mm-hmm. Um, you just look at a subject and say, "What? Are, how much detail do I want? Okay, there's your, how much fill light do you want? Well, what direction of light? Where's the positioning? Where are you going to pose that person in relationship to the light source? So I literally just look at the back of my camera. I mean, you're seeing a live exposure. And if, you, if you're talking about strobe as your main light, 
You've got to take that photograph and then have a look, but you can see the results straight away. Why would you waste your time doing it mathematically mm -hmm. when all you need to do is just look at how it makes you feel? Right. Um, so that that's the thing is I think too many photographers think, and I, and I find that this is a problem with most analytical men, especially who've come from a very analytical industry. Like you'll get a lot of guys who are in the tech software industry and then all of a sudden they've got this hobby and they, they've got that's those guys that wear the vest with the lenses in the front of the vest know, and, <laughs> and they'll, they'll just never be creative because they're, they're approaching the, the photography too technically. Right. And, you know, you think of the music industry that some of the most beautiful storytellers in the music industry are not technically great singers. No. But they make you feel so amazing with their storytelling, you identify with it. Right. So you've got to just understand, you know. The Beatles mostly use like three chords. Sure. You know? <laughs> yeah. well, storytellers. Yeah. Right? And yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, my challenge, because I primarily will find great light outdoors is if I need to add light because it's an overcast sky and there's no shade to put over their head. So I've got direction of light. I'm challenged to work with strobes without a meter that if I find, okay, I'm setting this at F8. What is that thing called? The aperture <laughs> at <laughs> F8. And so I'll set my my flash so that it's also f8 but as a direction and meter for that that helps me because otherwise i'm kind of winging it for a while but if i did it a lot i'm sure i could it's just like in that environment i'm like the the novice chef with additional light yeah. if i did it a lot i could definitely or I just used ice lights where you can just see it, right? <laughs> well, I think uh, here's the thing. I think that there, there are, everyone will have a different approach. I will tell you something different. You'll have another person on your podcast that will tell you something different. What we're saying here is that there are an infinite ways to get to a similar destination. If it's whether it's just taking a pretty shot as a hobbyist and you want to share on Instagram whether it's for a client, whether you're semi-pro, doesn't really matter as long as you enjoy what you do. I do think, though, some people gravitate towards some things. Basically, what you admitted right now, you are not confident using strobes or flashes, especially outdoors. So what you what you don't know, usually you fear and, and less confidence. What I'm, what my encouragement to you is, if the light source was there, let's say you've got the sun, it's hitting the back of somebody. Okay, so you've got now this. Most people in the, in today's industry, they're going to backlight everything. It just seems to be the trend and it's easy. I'll backlight everything. It's all soft and airy and all that stuff. So I want to, I want to clarify. I'm confident, but I use my meter. I'm not as practiced because... I totally get that, yeah. Because I, I'm great at finding light. Um, so, yes, totally, I know. Totally, totally get that. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying you're inexperienced in that perspective. I'm, I'm, as yes. a metaphor of what a lot of our... The way everyone either starts or continues or reinvents or whatever it doesn't really matter. What right. I'm basically getting at is that I think that we all have a particular approach. I think that when we start to identify creative triggers in our environment or literally liken outdoors to a studio, mm -hmm. your whole world changes. Right. And some people, in your case, you feel comfortable in getting that exposure, that 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 meter and firing off the flash, if it works, perfect. That's your comfort level. There are some people that will rely on the gear. Like you can, the pro photo, for example, you have a TTL mode and a, a manual mode. You can mm. let the camera, or the, the, the strobe or, the, or the, the speed light give you what it thinks to be a great exposure and you're somewhere in that, in that pocket, great. Flick it to manual and adjust accordingly based upon, again, so think of it like where your analogy of there of the, of the chef or the cook or whatever you know, Melissa, um, when she cooks, she follows the recipe, the menu to a T. She mm. never deviates. Where my, when my mum was still with us, um, Melissa would watch mum cook and she would try to diagnose what mum was trying to teach her. <laughs> and mum yeah. was like being a Greek family. Like she's like, I just, you know, just grab a pinch of salt and just put a bit of garlic in there, whatever. Like she would yeah. almost dispose of it. Like, why are you bothering me with the stupid details? Right. And, and Melissa were like, no, 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 just tell me why. It tastes good. So what I'm getting at is I don't care what meal you make. As long as it tastes good for you, to you, and for the people that you're feeding, 
your clients, the, your peers, whoever you're doing it for, how you get there, I don't really care. Um, if you can get there in a more fun and efficient and confident way, I think that that's where when you share knowledge and wisdom, I think that when someone shares with you a different approach or hopefully that even if one person you know, likens that metaphor of using light like water, it changes your whole perception of what light is. All of a sudden, your whole world opens up. You're not intimidated by it anymore. Yeah. It's just how do you sculpt it? Yeah, In other words, huge. how do you want to play fight? How do you want to do a water fight? You know? <laughs> right. Right. Well, Jerry, I really appreciate that because with that metaphor of of water from a hose, not like the ocean, uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's another thing, but sure. picturing it because I have some coaching clients where I'm remotely trying to help them understand the importance of a direction of light and why if the sun's going down, turning the people away from the sun is not going to give light on the face and uh, why bouncing right off the ceiling, which a lot of people talk about that you're going to get wet, but you're not, your face is not necessarily going to get the right, amount of water. So I right. will be using that later this week in a coaching <laughs> call because I'm always like when when you're outdoors, you need to find a direction of light. Right. When you need to get under something so the light's coming into the face or you need to block the light or you need to find something reflecting light or if the sky is overcast and you want some light in the face, you lay them on the ground and <laughs> because then you've got a soft box. So I'm going to use that uh, hose water analogy. I think that's going to pop a lot of people's uh, imagination in a way that, you know, like it's, it's hard to teach lighting remotely, but we can do it. There's no doubt. I, it, it's so crazy though, that I'm yet to see a light source that if you don't liken it to water, you don't understand. Even you said under your breath there about the ocean, Let's think about that. Let's I know you yeah. said it in jest, but let's push that for example. So let's think of let's think of landscape. Okay. You've got landscape. Let's say there's there's a, a bunch of mountains. It's not a lake yet. There's no water there yet. Now, why do you not photograph landscape in, in high noon? Well, what's happening is that you're not seeing any detail. You're not seeing any any depth, dimension, shape, and form. That's basically like flooding light in front of someone. Now, where does that work for you? Well, if you're photographing a beauty portrait and you mainly want to just see eyes and nostrils and, and lips and, you know, softness mm -hmm. of the skin, well, you flood the light from the top. You may even deflect that water, so to speak, from a beauty dish and then get it to fill in the shadow underneath the chin, for example. Mm -hmm. If you're photographing someone, let's say, with bad acne, if you have the light coming from the side, as in if you have water coming from the side, it'll hit and deflect the 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 acne and everything like that like little mini mountains mm -hmm. and you will see the shape in other words they'll cause mini shadows and parts of that face will not get wet quote unquote where you'll see that texture so you decide whether you use shadow when you're photographing the portrait and then fix it in post-production or, or do a bit of both like what's the lesser of the evils uh, in terms of what you're trying to portray or, or produce so it, it, it's amazing that, you know, if you are photographing, let's say, mature age skin, think of it like, like the Grand Canyon. There's a lot of lines and a lot of lines in, on your face and you've earned, you've earned those lines and smiling and crying and however you've lived your life. If you want to show that texture, then you may want to not fill up the Grand Canyon um, because you may make that person look too soft mm -hmm. or soft for the too soft for the purpose that you're trying to convey. So if you, normally most people want to look pretty, quote unquote, but if you're traveling abroad and you're, you know, you want to see a weathered face of a of a fisherman who's 90 years of age in Japan, you might want to see all those rugged lines of the face right. and everything. So lighting has to be flattering and or help communicate the message you're trying to convey to the viewer about that person. You just gave me a great idea. <laughs> so one of the perfect ways to study what you just said is to look at before and after quote unquote before and after beauty photographs of some product that's like going to help with wrinkles 
(laughs) and analyze because I look at those and I know clearly they were taken at the same time. And it's, it's, I can see how they changed the lighting. And then I can also see how they did a little Photoshop. Sure. And there was, oh my gosh, a photographer friend was supporting another friend who's selling a skincare product. So she posted this before and after of a thigh and the before it was all the what's it called like stretch marks or something or yeah the the chicken skin the you know cotton cottage cheese cellulite yeah yeah the lumps and then the second one it was smooth right and of course the subject was wearing the same shorts and the background was the same and i know that they moved that there was the ocean for the light that was supposedly (laughs) after Right. And then they moved the hose to way to the side so that it caught every little bump and wrinkle. Right. And I could also see where they did a little fill in on some of the highlights on the one where it looked like a miracle. Right. And so a person could do a whole, like try to recreate befores and afters to make somebody look like, and also positioning of the light, you know, if you right. put it, low or high you get different streaks and wrinkles so yeah maybe i'll teach a class <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. On, let's get somebody willing to have their body parts look wrinkly and smooth <laughs> and and just in lighting and i had to um stop seeing that particular post because especially as a fine photographer who posted it that she wouldn't instantly see oh this is just a trick by lighting. This has nothing to do with this product. Uh, you know, so I had to take my judgment away and, you know, just stop seeing well, it. Yeah, I mean, speaking on that though, what is the truth? Like what is, what is anyone's truth? Like mm-hmm. even a photojournalist, when you, when you, if you're talking about like purity uh, or, or reporting news, just by perspective and angle and choice and compression and everything, you will tell a different truth. The way you crop, you will tell a different truth. If you're talking about, you could actually photograph a, uh, a, a mother and who's basically expecting a baby or it could be anything. And some people would be offended by retouching too much. And some people you'll be crucified if you don't. Mm-hmm. So really everyone will have a, uh, you know, a preference and a priority. It's understanding expectations, meeting and hopefully exceeding them. And there'll be times where you will show, you know, the the tiger stripes, so to speak, stretch marks of a of a mother who 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 gave birth to a beautiful baby who spent the, the whole life and maybe spending ten years in in IVF and finally earned those stripes. And some people will like wouldn't be caught dead with a photograph of their tummy with those stripes. What's the truth? Doesn't matter. What's your truth? Mm-hmm. What do you want to show? And, you know, I, the way I see it, a lot of women especially who do makeup on themselves and hair, they you don't do that to look like you do every other day of the week. We simply all want to shine brighter. Mm-hmm. And to some, it's, uh, you know, you'll barely put eyeliner and some will do nothing and some will do everything. And there's some guys who love makeup as well. It doesn't matter. Like, it, you just do what you want. And then, you you know, as far as the photographer is concerned, you basically promote the shots that you like to do. And you will, by not saying a word, you are attracting a clientele that identify with those shots. Right. And then, and therefore you will be, you, you'll attract the clients that ex- will book you for exactly the kind of work that you're showing. Right. You know, right. so. I love it. I love yeah. it. Oh, well, Jerry, I knew this would be super fun and that the hardest thing would be getting that, narrowing the hose down. So, because uh, you're go. like the fountain uh, <laughs> of everything. Uh, so, t- two questions. If someone wants to get in touch with you, where should they go? So, any any website that is remotely uh, connected to, to me uh, all goes to my wife. She basically is my pimp. <laughs> so whether you want to be taught by, uh, you want to learn from me, whether you want to be photographed by me, whether it's a wedding portrait fashion or whatever, whether it's an in-person workshop, um, I make it really easy. I have a website called Jerry, Jerry, Jerry with a J, like Jerry, Jerry, Jerry.com. That is my uh, link in my bio of my Instagram that will, that will send you to a link tree 
that will point you to every direction of what we do. So whether you want to learn from me online or in person, whether you want to be photographed by me or keep up to date with different things, that is the, uh, that's the easiest way that I can Great. put it. So jerryjerryjerry.com. Okay, Jerry, Jerry, Jerry. Great. <laughs> yeah, I noticed, and I assume it's there as well. I was on jerrygionis.com and I saw if you want some goodies, click here. Yeah, yeah. There's a, basically there's a, you know if you want some uh, free you know ways of me learning from me and different things like that, go to jerrygionis.com and um, yeah, you click on free goodies and you can sort of download some really cool stuff. Great. And then keep keep in the loop of all the all our offerings. Good. So my last question is either if there's something you haven't shared that you want to be sure. Oh, I want to teach about this or just your last word, you know, kind of parting thoughts for us to ponder in our hearts. Oh man, I whenever I'm speaking to an audience, most people are looking for inspiration. They're looking for some kind of gem, some little way of some little impetus behind change to reinvent oneself and all these different things. And I, I think if I was to give my three or four, you know, things that I, I like to impart people with, I, I say, remember the repetition experience and practice will always be your best teacher. Um, I encourage people to focus on the, the, the process, not the result. If you're a business owner, work on your business, not just in it. Pretend like you're going to go hungry because maybe one day you will. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's many, many things, but I think that we get intimidated by other people who've traveled the path before us. So you can either be intimidated or be inspired, but I remind people that you don't have to be the best. You simply have to be better than last week. Mm, perfect. All right. Well, everyone stay tuned for my wrap up. And Jerry, I just want to thank you so much. Uh, I accosted him at W at Whippy, W P I. <laughs> and it was like, hey, Jerry, would you be on my show? And he kindly said, of course. So <laughs> Thank you for saying yes. And I know my audience is going to be so excited. It was funny because when you asked me, you sort of asked me expecting me to say no. And I'm like, no, of course. If, if, if you know, if we want to share inspiration and whether it's a, to one person, whether it's the thousands, if we can make a difference to one person, then uh, our job is, is done. So, you mm -hmm. know, the same way that I was inspired and I continue to be inspired by other people who've, who've been on this path uh, before me, with me, and and all that stuff, then that's the responsibility that we all have. So it's, it's fun, to, fun to share. And uh, thank you for the opportunity, Lucy. I appreciate You're it. You're welcome. All righty then. So just a quick reminder, I would love for you to join my group program called the Profitable Photographer Sales Academy. You know, you can be the best at everything, photography and getting great leads and making people happy. But if you don't know how to sell your work, it is not necessarily going to result in the results you want. So my core teaching, my superpower is helping people have incredible sales of wall portraits and photographs and whatever else you might want to sell. So this course repeats, but it starts with a six-month, six-module group of episodes that we have two classes a month and we have some other activities and such. So jump on over to lucydumascoaching.com and look for classes and just get in touch. You can even just Facebook message me if you don't want to set up a real call that we have time on Zoom. Okay. So I feel pretty good about being able to mine some of the gold of the treasure that is Jerry Guionis. I asked him what he was most proud of, and he's very proud of his relationship with Melissa, which is amazing. Um, and he shared how his first big milestone was being named wedding photographer in the 10 best wedding photographers in the American Photo Magazine and his grand prize at WPPI. And he talked about how he's always reinventing himself and that even just in the last little while he's produced some of the best work he's ever done and we talked about how to make commitments to ourselves so that we you know we're not just sitting around spinning our wheels and he talked about the value of routine of setting up a challenge and a deadline and going for it and then I loved his conversation about 
thinking about lighting like it's water uh, and it could be it could be the ocean or it could be coming out of a hose but that we're spraying people with light and the size of the spray and the intensity changes everything and the direction as well he says there's lots of ways to get to our destination which is we were talking about light but find what works and enjoy it so i'm sure that you loved this conversation as much as I did, and I'll be seeing you again soon. Bye now. You have been listening to The Highly Profitable Photographer with Lucy Dumas. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe, review, and share. To connect one-on-one and learn more about our coaching programs, just go to lucydumascoaching.com. Until next time, go have fun photographing and selling your work.